Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and I'm so glad you could join us. Tonight, we are thrilled to launch the second episode in our collaborative series in partnership with the Association of Rama Tishaloni, the original peoples of the San Francisco Peninsula. Please join us in welcoming the incredible Karina Gould. It is beyond an honor to host Karina tonight. This short intro can't even begin to explain the depths of her work. So please see our website for her full bio. As a tribal leader, she has continued to fight for the protection of the shell mounds, uphold her nation's inherent right to sovereignty, and stand in solidarity with her indigenous relatives to protect our sacred waters, mountains, and lands all over the world. Please join me in welcoming Karina Gould. First of all, I want to thank Francis so much for that wonderful introduction. It's a wonderful opportunity to be here with all of you virtually tonight. I wanted to share some of my uh, information about our tribe and the work that we've been doing on the East Bay. I am the tribal chairperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon, on whose land I have always been on. We have an unbroken tie to our territories. And although there has been a lot of misinformation about who we are, I'd like to clear some of that up tonight in our little chat. And then I'd love to have some conversation, some questions and answers at the end before we're done. And so I wanted to um, share this slideshow. It says, welcome to Hu Chin. Although you are all probably calling in or dialing in from many different places, different territories in the world, but Hu Chin is a place that I live. It's a place that is in the East Bay uh, where my ancestors have been for thousands and thousands of years. And Hu Chin as a territory encompasses actually six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Emeryville, Albany and Piedmont. And um, it is, like I said, many, many different um, territories here. I like to start off this talk with, uh, to talk about this one um, beautiful quote by Rowan White. It says, my body is a cartography of stories of ancestors asking not to be forgotten. We are not a conquered people. And I think about this when I wake up every day in my traditional territory of Kuchin and my traditional homelands that our cartography uh, has changed um, over the last couple of hundred years that the landscape that we see in this urbanized area is not the same landscape that my ancestors saw for thousands and thousands of years while caretaking this land. But it's a landscape that I continue to see through my own eyes. Um, and behind me, you'll see a beautiful mountain. And that's the mountain that we were created on. It's called Tushtak. And Tushtak is what most people in the Bay Area know as Mount Diablo. It is the very place of our creation story where we began. It was not just what most people know as Ohlone people that started there, but all of the tribes that are a part of the Confederation of Lashon. It is made up, it's the creation story for the Bay Miwok and the Plains Miwok and the Delta Yokut and the Nampian, as well as the Ohlone. And our tribe is a confederation of all of those tribes that were brought in um, and enslaved at Mission Dolores. My ancestors lived here for thousands of years with their own spirituality, their own uh, economy, a way of living in reciprocity with the land, a way that our ancestors had been here. Uh, something that we as human beings are talking about now, a way of leaving a smaller footprint on the earth. We talk about that now as we're in climate disaster, that we need to leave a smaller footprint. And my ancestors did just that like many indigenous people across the world, we lived in ways that was in reciprocity with the lands and the waters and all that we were created with. And so our houses and our boats and many of the things that we use on a daily basis were biodegradable. They went back into the land. And so there was not a lot left um, as people will say when they got here, that there was, um, they thought that there was no infrastructure but actually there was a great way that my ancestors took care of this land. There were diaries that were written by people that came to this land first and talked about how the forests and the lands were taken so well taken care of that you could see straight through and that there, the, um, the lands were taken care of 
um, even as well as the parks in Europe. And it was because of that reciprocity, that relationship with the lands and the waterways that my ancestors had, that this land was taken care of in such a way that brought this abundance into the Bay Area. And I like to talk about this abundance because I believe that the Bay Area is still full of that abundance. 200 years later, that there is all of this abundance here. You see, a couple of hundred years ago in the Bay Area, there was no such concept. There's no concept of hunger or homelessness here. There was enough for everyone. That there was fresh water in all of the beautiful creek ways where salmon and trout would come up. There was an abundance here. But today we still see that abundance, that abundance of wealth, of monetary wealth, of wealth of minds and wealth of ideas and wealth of generosity here in the Bay Area that still live here. I believe that my ancestors laid down prayers for all of us thousands of years ago so that abundance would stay here in this magical place that I call home, this magical place that many people call home, where ideas for technology of movements um, have grown out of the Bay Area. The missionaries came um, with Spanish soldiers. And, and that was the first contact that we had with outside people. Our ancestors had lived in that reciprocity of dream time. And when the Spanish soldiers came with the missionaries, our lives changed dramatically. I imagine a way that people didn't, and never knew about imprisonment and never knew about working the land in the way that Europeans brought to this had no idea about, um, about the, the horrific uh, whippings and murders that happened. This idea of all of these things that came to the land and changed it along with disease and foods that were not um, grown here before and people being introduced to new animals caused waves and waves of disease and uh, dysentery and people dying. And so that many thousands of my ancestors died when the mission systems uh, started up here in California. Some of you might have remembered if you were um, brought up here in the Bay Area, you learned in fourth grade about the missions. And some people still talk about the missions in fourth grade curriculum. And the missions, um, there were 21 of them and they started at the base of California and they worked their way up um, through the Bay Area. And the missions only lasted for 21 years. Um, I mean, 99 years, I'm sorry, 99 years. And in that time of 99 years that the missions were here, they wreaked havoc on the people that, um, that were here. They were imprisoned once they were baptized into these missions and became the property of the Catholic church and were forced into working um, for the rest of their lives. And so my ancestors knew a very different reality once that happened. Um, but like I said, the missions only lasted 99 years. And then what happened, there was, um, my ancestors were enslaved at two of those missions, Mission Dolores in San Francisco and Mission San Jose in Fremont. And both of these missions um, held our ancestors for the, that time being and changed our lives dr drama dramatically. But when... Um, when our ancestors were finally let to go home, what they thought they were left to go home after the Mexican and uh, Spanish war and Mexico won, my ancestors actually didn't have land to go back to. You see, our people were first called Costanoan, um, people from the coast. When the Spanish mission first got here and um, the explorers or the settlers first got here, those colonizers, they called all of the people along the coast here in this area, Coast Anoan, uh, people from the coast. At that time, they thought that we all dressed alike and looked alike and uh, had the same kind of houses. And so we must all be the same. But actually, we're eight different uh, nations of people that speak eight different languages. And our songs and our dances are different. And we had many village sites within our language bases. And what I like, and it's still like that today. There's not one overarching tribe of Ohlone people, what people now generically know as Ohlone. There's not one overarching tribe, even in a language area of those places. I am the, uh, the chairperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon, 
And we share this language territory of Chochenyo with four, uh, three other um, uh, tribal nations that also take care of this land. My people um, have, are the people that took care of the land in this Chochenyo territory, the language I first spoke to you in. My great-grandfather, Jose Guzman, was one of the last speakers of the language. When Mexico stole the land and continued the enslavement of indigenous people, it was interesting um, that happened. Uh, my ancestors still couldn't go back to their daily lives of living that had happened before where they were able to fish and to hunt and to live on the land. They instead were given over to the ranchos that they were given to um, the Mexican soldiers um, as their uh, reward for fighting in the war. My ancestors um, were a part of a bunch of different ranchos, but the rancho that I'm talking about today is the Peralta Land Grant, the Rancho San Antonio that goes through Huchin territory at the border of Oakland and all the way through Albany. Uh, my ancestors lived in this area uh, for thousands and thousands of years. And here's Lake Merritt, just to give you kind of a sense of where you're at. My ancestors went from being uh, slaves at the Mission San Jose to being slaves on this lands of the Peraltas. It was written that my great grandfather, Jose Guzman died on Peralta land. He died in 1937 and uh, before my mother was born, but before he died, he was able to leave uh, songs and words uh, to J.P. Harrington, who was a linguist that went um, all, over the, um, all over this part of the world, at least, um, trying to take down as much information from tribes whose language was going to sleep. And he was able to do that for us. Um, so after the Rancho period happened, there was a 1848 uh, Mexico and American ha America had a war and the land was stolen for a third time. And this third time was by the United States. And instead of slavery, um, it was now about mass extermination. Mass extermination uh, created by laws when California first became a state. And this is history that's never told. It's not talked about. We don't find out about this history. How does California begin? We hear about my ancestors in fourth grade and then by fifth grade, we hear about this great wave of people coming to uh, California looking for gold. And so they don't hear about the laws of extermination for California Indian people. California spent $1.4 million killing California native people from the bottom of California all the way to the top, spending $5 a head and 25 cents an ear backed by federal dollars. And you see that not all people coming to California looking for gold could actually find gold, but you could make a pretty penny um, killing off native people and they would go into villages on Sundays and kill the adults and take the children and sell them into servitude um, in, the, in the towns. And this is how um, our families also began to wither apart and begin to hide. There was, uh, we survived boarding schools and Indian foster care after that. Our families were ripped apart. Our children were taken and put um, thousands of miles away from their hometowns. My, um, my mom and my uncle and my auntie, my auntie who's the matriarch of our family and tribe uh, was sent to Chamawa boarding school in Oregon. As uh, children, they were there to learn how to assimilate into the American culture. My auntie's still alive, like I said, uh, she went to this Indian boarding school in Chamawa, uh, Oregon, which is still in, in existence and still running. And she was placed in Indian foster care when she was about 12 years old, which is much different than foster care today. Foster care today is about trying to reunite families and to help out children who are in a difficult situation when they have no adults to take care of them. Indian foster care then in the 1940s and 50s um, was about really doing the assimilation some more. And they did, um, a lot of what I call indentured servitude with the children. When my auntie turned 12 years old, she was sent to a family home in San Leandro, California. 
And she tells this story a few years ago to us while we're sitting in her living room. And two of my cousins were there and they had never heard the story from their mother. And she talked about how she was sent to this family in San Leandro. And what a beautiful, you know, a great white family that they were, that they took care of her. And, but she cleaned for them and washed their clothes and took care of their children and cooked. And that this nice family wanted to put her in school in San Leandro. And San Leandro disallowed her from going to school because she was too dark. Now, this is not a long time ago. This is within a lifetime, right? My auntie is 84 years old. So this happened uh, not that long ago here in the Bay Area, where we think of progression, where we think about um, all of these great ideas that come here, that there's a movement here, that we're different than other parts of the world, but we're really not. It really was the same not that long ago. We were in hiding, like I said. There's, we were hiding from being hunted down, and for a few generations, our people uh, felt it was best not to be Native it was easier to survive in this world, to not be taken from your families, to pretend because our families had learned Spanish while they were in the mission churches and while they worked on the ranchos, it was easier to learn how to just kind of assimilate into the American society and be Mexican rather than being Indian. But it has been in my lifetime that I've been able to stand up that Ohlone people, even if it's a generic term, we began to, uh, talk about our own sovereignty, our own way of being here, our rights to be here on our land, a right to be visible again. You see those ways of teaching us only in fourth grade and only in the past actually is detrimental to Ohlone people because it doesn't say that we're still here. It keeps us in this romanticized idea of these simple people that lived a long time ago, but we're not. We're still here standing up for our sacred lands and our burial sites and working along people um, all over the Bay Area to create a visibility for us again. In 1909, this man named Nels Nelson created a map of shell mounds in the Bay Area. These are our burial sites, our ceremonial places, our villages. In 1909, there was so much development happening in the Bay Area over a hundred years ago that Nels Nelson knew that if he didn't take really good count and find out where these places were, these places of wonder, these monuments that our ancestors left here for thousands of years, that they would be gone. And in 1909, he was able to trace and find 425 shell mounds that ring the Bay Area. These monuments, these uh, birthing places, these cemeteries, these village sites of my ancestors, you see, it was quite populous here, even though we talk about how there was very few Native people in the area. There were actually thousands of people that lived here in the abundance of the Bay. And 1999 or 2000, um, I began to work with Janella LaRose and we created an organization called Indian People Organizing for Change. And it was really about talking about the Bay Area in a different kind of way because just as in 1909, there was all of this development happening in the Bay Area. In about 1999, the same thing was happening. You see this crazy thing happened in the Bay Area and was called what I call the dot-com era, um, but the internet was created and people was being pushed out of their homes in waves, um, a gentrification that we've seen throughout the Bay Area many times, but this internet, which we are blessed to have um, today that I'm able to talk to you through this, um, this process, uh, really brought a lot of money into the Bay Area and people started outbidding each other for homes and apartments and they started building again. And as they were building, they started to destroy the oldest, the, not the oldest, the largest of the 425 shell mounds in the Bay Area. You see, it had been destroyed once before, the Emeryville shell mound, um, was taken down early on um, and it survived for a long time because there was a dance pavilion on top of it and there was a shell mound park was created. But they took it down and took uh, a lot of the material that had my ancestor remains in it and they paved the streets of Berkeley and Emeryville on our ancestors. They created um, uh, many factories in, uh, that were there and there were no EPA laws and people 
uh, dumped lots of toxic things in there. Around the time of that, all of this uh, um, new uh, technology was coming into the Bay Area, the city of, Emory, of Emeryville received a grant to clean up the brownfield that was there along Temescal Creek that caused all of this sludge and toxicity to go into the bay every time it rained. And they decided to clean it up and start and put on top of it the Emeryville Shell, on top of the Emeryville Shell on the Bay Street Mall, and decided not to talk about very much about the history of our people. Um, so we decided we stopped, we fought them of doing that kind of work of starting a mall on top of this place because we wanted to talk about the history of Ohlone people. And so um, we went out and we lost the fight of them putting the mall on top of there. So on the corner of Ohlone Way and Shell Mound Street, um, we show up with our allies and accomplices. And we've been doing this for 20 years now. Um, on, the, on the busiest shopping day of the year, the day after Thanksgiving, we show up there with signs and literature. We show up there with songs and prayers. And we come out and we educate the Bay Area about what this place really is. Because no matter what they put on top of it, our ancestors' bodies still remain below this mall. It is still a sacred place for us. And so it's important for us to tell the truth to the history of the Bay Area that's not taught in the schools, that's not taught in history books, but that people should know what happens um, in the Bay Area because of the building and construction that happens here. It's a continuous uh, taking away of our culture. We are so blessed to have hundreds of people show up every year um, to stand up and to do this work for us. Um, and when we're out of COVID and it's safe, I invite all of you to come and join us as well. We always meet on the day after Thanksgiving from noon to three o'clock um, on the corner of Ohlone and Shell Mound, Shell Mound Street. So the West Berkeley Shell Mound is three miles away from Emeryville Shell Mound. It is the oldest of all 425 Shell Mounds that ring the Bay Area. And currently um, I am fighting to protect and preserve that shell mound. We've been fighting to protect, protect it for over five years currently, but the shell mound um, has been under attack for many, many years. Uh, five years ago, a developer came in and wanted to build this, um, this top picture, which is high rise condominiums and big box stores there and, uh, and to um, virtually destroy the last piece of the West Berkeley Shell Mound that is existence. 1900 Fourth Street, if you go there today, it's on Fourth and University, it looks like a empty parking lot. It looks flat, it runs around the railroad tracks, but it is a remnant of the very first shell mound or burial site of my ancestors. It was a ceremonial site. It was the place, first place that my ancestors lived along the bay where fresh met water met salt water. It was where Strawberry Creek ran into the bay and there was a marsh there. And as we began to do this work with the zoning board and the landmarks commissioned and the public, we came up with this vision of creating something else there, something different, something that could talk to the history of Ohlone people. Because there's nowhere in the Bay Area that you can go and take your friends from all over the world and tell them this is the history and these are the people that live here. There's no one place that you can do that at. So we've thought that in this two acre parcel of land that sits there, that's virtually been untouched for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, that maybe we could do that. Maybe we could create a mound on top of that and cover it with poppies. And four months out of the year, it would be popping orange. And we could put a uh, open up Strawberry Creek where it had been originally and build up the land to grow trees there again and have a ceremonial arbor and to have a place where people could sit inside of this, uh, this, uh, sh this shell mound, this recreation and have a theater where you can sit and it would be 360 degrees and you can see, hear, smell and feel 
what it was like to be at a shell mound a few hundred years ago. In 2020, West Berkeley Shell Mound was named one of the 11 most endangered historic places in the country. And we had been in, um, we had one in the lower courts to stop the development from happening. And in the appeals court, they, we lost. And most recently we tried to appeal to the California State Supreme Court and they wouldn't hear us. And so we're still trying to figure out ways to protect and preserve the sacred land to stop the destruction from happening. And we have been um, blessed to have leaders from all over the world that have come and prayed with us on that land. And as again, as we go out of COVID soon, I hope, I hope to invite all of you to come and pray with us on this sacred land. We also started the Segorite Land Trust in the meantime. It's the first urban indigenous women-led land trust in the country. And it's important to say that because there's land trusts all over the country and there's some that are run by women, but this is the first urban indigenous women-led land trust and it happens to be in my territory. And it's important for us to do this work um, together because there are indigenous women that have been moved to the, um, to the Bay Area on relocation programs of the United States. Um, who have not been able to go home to their own reservations. There are indigenous women that have come here from other parts of the world that have made this their home. And it's important for us to work together to bring back ceremony and song um, to these lands and to remind people how to live in reciprocity with the lands. Our very first piece of land in uh, 200 years was given, 250 years was given back to us. It's a piece of land, sorry, um, in East Oakland, um, it's, um, it's on LaShawn Creek, which our ancestors are named after. It's the fresh water that went into the bay. Um, as many people know as San Leandro um, or San Lorenzo Creek. And so our ancestors, uh, I like to say, they, they play tricks on us sometimes and they make me laugh because um, this place that was given back to us is a uh, piece of land that is on, that's on the backside of Planting Justice Nursery. And this piece of land is a half mile walk from my home. And this piece of land is probably very close to a village site my ancestors had inhabited for thousands and thousands of years. And it was because of the work that people were doing to, in, um, um, in, in uh, the Dakotas um, that, for, that created this relationship between ourselves and Planting Justice. And um, Planting Justice, uh, Gavin and Hale, the young people that, um, that run this organization, um, they came back from Standing Rock and uh, with this idea of giving us back a quarter acre of land that's on this nursery, this organic nursery that um, works with formerly incarcerated men and women. And we agreed to take this land back on the condition that we were able to do work with them, that we created a relationship with them because we didn't know them. And how weird would it be for us to do this work without having relationships? So rematriation is indigenous women's work. And I mean, to, and when we talk about rematriation, it means to restore a living culture to its rightful place on mother earth or to restore people to a spiritual way of life in sacred relationship with their ancestral lands without external interference. As a concept, rematriation acknowledges that our ancestors lived in spiritual relationship with our lands for thousands of years, and that we have a sacred duty to maintain that relationship for the benefit of our future generations. Stephen Newcomb, um, who is the executive director of the Indigenous Law Center, came up with this um, piece of the, um, the definition of rematriation. But rematriation, we really want to emphasize, has to be women's work. When we decided to create the Segorite Land Trust, Janella and I um, had a conversation about what does it mean for us to do this work, to begin to put indigenous lands back into indigenous hands to recreate uh, our ceremonial places to um, bring language and culture and song back to the lands. 
it was our responsibility as mothers, as matriarchs in our society, for us to do this important work to bring balance back into these lands, not without our sons, not without our grandsons or our niece, our nephews or our uncles or brothers, but to remind each other what our sacred responsibilities are to be on these lands and what is our connection and to share that out not only with our relatives, but everyone living in our territory. You see this circle here is that first piece of land that I was talking about. This circle of people that are not just tribal people, but are people from different faiths and different backgrounds and intersection of people that are here. A place where LaShawn Creek ran uh, for thousands of years. And you can see it culverted there on the right-hand side. And uh, just past that tree, you can see the 880 freeway and that is all on fill. And so the bay literally came to that area. And if we're unwise and don't take care of our bay right now, it'll come back to that particular area in not that long time. So we decided to take this land and to clean it up and to create a space where we can have ceremony, we can grow our medicinal plant and we could create a hameka. And Hameka in our language means a place where we all gather. It's a place where we are building resiliency hubs, a place where we brought a container that holds medicines, traditional medicines and first aid kits. And um, we're building an outdoor kitchen and putting in rain catchment systems um, for natural made and uh, man-made disasters. We, uh, where LaShawn land is, is in deep East Oakland. In Sobrani Park, it's a place where um, many people will not come to save our folks that are living there. And so we wanted to make sure it's our traditional responsibility to take care of our neighbors, to ensure that there's a safe place for people to gather and have that covers created. We are working on um, bringing back our Chochenyo language. My daughter, Deja Gould, is the language carrier for our tribe. And she, we have uh, recently created the first Chochenyo Language Institute in the Bay Area. Um, and she has been throughout uh, before and throughout our COVID time has been teaching language to our, tri our, our tribal members and our, um, our tribal members that are close to us that are um, um, our neighbors. Um, and we've been doing this on Zoom and we've been blessed to do that. We are putting the names to our traditional foods here in the Bay Area on signage that people can see. We're re-engaging with the land through um, the work that our ancestors had always done with the tule and learning how to weave again. And we work the land in many different places with people from all walks of life that come and volunteer and put their hands in the ground. And if you've read the book, uh, braiding sweetgrass. Robin Kimmerer talks about a time where she takes students out and it doesn't matter um, if they've been in the uh, worked in land before or not. But she says that about eight minutes into having your hands in the dirt, um, we naturally as human beings begin to hum or sing. And that it's a natural way of living in reciprocity with our land. And I think that through this COVID time, many people have started to grow things, have started to reimagine what it looks like to have a garden at home, have uh, surrounded themselves with plants in their apartments. And what a wonderful way for us to learn to be in reciprocity with our relatives that are plants that give us medicine and oxygen and, and love. During COVID times, we created a community food distribution program, not knowing that that's what we were going to do. Um, but uh, it called out to us that we were growing food at the Giltrack Farm in Albany and the farm had been closed down because of UC Berkeley. And uh, we were able to talk them in um, along with the other farmers that worked that land to allow us to um, begin to harvest the food that was there. And we began to give out food to hundreds of people that were elders and immunosuppressed and frontline workers and women with small children, um, fresh food that they were unable to get. And we continue to do that today as the Segorite Land Trust to give food as part of our traditional working. Uh, we also provide a hot meal once a month to our 
uh, relatives that live without a roof over their head. We do a lot of this work because of Shumi and Shumi in our language means a gift. It's because of the generosity of the people in the Bay Area that live, work or play in our traditional territories to give us um, financial support. We are still here. This is a small portion of our tribe um, that still gather together. Um, there are many different generations that live in our territory that continue to love and grow here. Um, that are reimagining our grandchildren growing with language and ceremony in their lives, uh, imagining them learning how to gather our acorns again and to, uh, to gather our seeds and to, to have a grounding in their own homeland where we have been mostly homeless for the last 200 years. Our future generations are here. These are three of my grandbabies. This is the work that I do in my territory um, to ensure that they can continue to thrive and survive in this territory that, have, um, that they have been placed on, that we have an unbroken tie for thousands and thousands of years. Walking, I'm listening to a deeper way. Suddenly, all my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say. Watch and listen. You are the result of the love of thousands. And uh, I want to thank Linda Hogan for uh, this beautiful uh, quote that I was able to do. I think I'm going to be able to stop sharing right now, and I'm going to be able to take some uh, questions from all of you in the audience. So we have a couple of questions I'll start off with. It says, how can museums and cultural institutions support this work in the Bay Area? What kind of partnerships within your ancestral homelands are or would be transformative for the Segorite Land, Land Trust? Well, thank you so much for that question. Uh, we are actually doing amazing work with city governments right now in a lot of different ways. And um, many institutions are coming. We've actually created a relationship with the Richmond Museum and my daughter just did a language project with them where um, you can go into the Richmond Museum now and there's a touch screen um, where you could touch the screen and you can see a uh, beautiful uh, drawing uh, illustration um, of a, a word like bear and you can hear the word in Xochenyo and They've done that for many different words. And so that's a beautiful way for us to, to talk about that. So we're working in partnerships with institutions like that. The city of Berkeley changed their signage going into um, the city. All entrances says, welcome to Berkeley, Ohlone territory. We're working with the city of Albany to do similar things um, and the city of San Leandro. Uh, the city of Alameda is the first city to have uh, created a, or renamed a park Chochenyo Park in Alameda, and they also made it a part of their, um, their yearly budget to pay Shumi. Um, and so they're the first city to do that. And uh, working with the um, institutions of UC Berkeley and many of the higher education institutions in the Bay Area to talk about that and talking with the city of Oakland about actually returning land. And what does that look like to return land to the first indigenous people on whose land your, your um, city now lives on and rests on? And how do we build reciprocity and bring everyone that is now the guests of our land into the work of taking and care of our waterways and our lands and living in reciprocity with one another? And it really is about creating relationships with one another um, through one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, talking to people. Uh, so thank you for that. I have another question that says, can you talk more about Shumi land tax and the importance of it with regard to the rematriation of land? I thank you so much. Shumi was not, uh, Shumi is a concept that was created that we actually borrowed and we asked permission from the Wiat tribe um, up in Northern California. And some years ago, they were given an island back that was their traditional territory. And the island was given back to them with, um, a lot of uh, things that needed to be cleaned up and some environmental hazardous things. And so they were relying on um, donations of, from people. And the seventh generation fund, Tia Peters 
and her husband, Chris Peters, um, started this uh, land tax for them. And we asked if we could borrow that, and we did. About five years ago, I believe, I worked with um, our, our now development director, Ariel Lecky, and he and his, hus um, his, his wife and his father created this idea, this platform for Shumi. And Shumi is a way for you to give, um, to help do this work of rematriation. It pays for our staffing and our offices. It pays for all the materials um, that we use to do the work on the land. Um, it helps us to bring in guests um, to help us to do the work of rematriation in different kinds of ways to recreate culture. It helped us to build our, the first arbor in our territory in 250 years. But it also helps us to engage with each other in a different kind of way to begin to think about the history of what happened on this land before you or your family got here. How do we begin to live in reciprocity with each other? What does rematriation mean and how can you, how can um, Shumi help you to, um, to pay that forward to the next seven generations that are coming behind us? And so Shumi helps us, and you can go on our website, segoritelandtrust.org, and there's a whole thing about Shumi, and you can plug in whether you're a homeowner or you're a renter, and it asks you a few different questions, and it gives you a, an idea of what you might want to give, and you can give on a monthly basis, you can give a one-time deal, you can do that. We also have a rematriation fund that we just launched, um, and that is specifically to purchase land. And the Segorite Land Trust, um, just a week or two weeks ago, purchased his first home um, in Oakland. And this home is going to be a forever home for a family with uh, two children with disabilities. We're going to probably create a hemetka there in that neighborhood so that these hemetkas can be um, in specific places all along the Bay Area so that places people will have these touchstones to go in times of disaster. We also have uh, that this next question. Um, are there books or resources you can recommend Bay Area residents read to better understand the Ohlone experience? There is a beautiful resource page on the Segorite Land Trust uh, website that has uh, lots of things that you could read, uh, films that you can see, talks that I have done. Uh, we did. Um, a uh, beautiful uh, talking show over the COVID period. And you can watch those, uh, those episodes, Seeding, Seeding Sovereignty. Um, um, and it, it, those are great things to do. Um, I think I could, uh, I think that we're gonna close up today. Um, I just wanna thank you so much for the opportunity to be here in this space and to, um, to be with all of you today. I look forward to creating relationships with all of you to working together, to rematriate land, to work in reciprocity, and to build a future for the next seven generations and beyond. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Karina Gould and a huge thank you to the Association of Ramatushaloni. It has been such a pleasure to work with you and build with you. Please join us for Virtual Wednesdays on November 10th for the final episode in this collaborative series. And thank you always for supporting Virtual Wednesdays. We hope to see you next week.